Um, yes, thank you for inviting me. Uh, yeah, I, I work in the Astroecology Research Group at Liverpool John Moores University. As you might guess, astroecology is a highly interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, I work with ecologists, obviously, engineers, computer scientists, roboticists, and, and all together we, we work on this project. Um, I have to confess, I am in fact an astrophysicist and not an ecologist at all. Um, the astroecology project starts with this problem, um, one that we're all very familiar with, then, that is the global biodiversity crisis that we're currently experiencing. Now, we want to do a lot of things to sort of help stop this crisis from being a crisis, such as monitoring wildlife, uh, preventing poaching, preventing habitat loss. But in the first instance, to really do good conservation, we need to know a lot about the things that we're trying to conserve. Um, and in some cases, that just means going out and counting them all. Now, none of these sort of things are very easy to do. Part of the reason for this is that animals tend to live over large areas, um, very wild places. For example, we've got Kruger National Park here, which is bigger than Wales. So if you could imagine trying to walk around that on the ground to monitor all the animals or drive around in a car all day trying to count the poachers, it's obviously a huge task. So to solve this problem, we want to use drones. Uh, as we know, with a drone, we can cover a very big area very quickly, uh, get the bird's eye view of the animals. Um, you can get over difficult terrain. I believe the so a foot survey through the forest can cover about 100 meters per hour, whereas with a drone, you can cover square kilometers in 20 minutes. So there's a lot of obvious advantages to using drones over conventional foot surveys. So let's take an example of some data from a drone survey. Um, so this is with a very conventional camera stuck on the drone. And can you see some animals here? I can't see the chat. So I was going to ask how many animals people can see, but the, the chat has gone for me. So. Uh, can everyone agree you can see about three animals here? Um, but would you be able to guess what species of animal that is from this image? So I'll give you a clue, it is water buffalo. So let's say you go and do your drone survey, you gather a whole bunch of data, you take it back to your home institu institute in the UK or America or whatever, and you have your army of master students pour over this data, miscounting and misclassifying all the animals in the data. It actually gets worse than this, here is some data that we took over the forest in Mexico. And this tree in the middle here is absolutely full of spider monkeys, a critically endangered primate. I think we can all agree that it's impossible to see any spider monkeys here. You can't see a single one. But if we look with the thermal infrared camera instead, the animals really appear quite obviously. So all these little white yellow blobs in the tree there, those are the spider monkeys. And with a thermal camera, sorry, my light's going off. Um, we're seeing the animals as a result of their body heat. Um, heat is uh, a type of electromagnetic radiation, it's light, light that is emitted from the body as a result of heat. So the animals are literally shining and glowing. And this glow is exactly the same kind of glow that stars and galaxies have in space. So the idea was that we would use techniques from astronomy to find animals in the same way that we use to find and understand stars and galaxies out in space. Now we're quite used to this sort of uh, different way of looking at the at, at objects in astronomy. If you take your favorite galaxy and you look at it with a regular optical telescope, you sort of see what you might expect. But when you start to look in, in different wavelengths, such as infrared and ultraviolet, you see different properties, such as where the stars are forming, where the stars are exploding, things like that. So I thought we'll just bring all this together um, and we will create a pipeline to automatically detect and identify all the animals as a result of their thermal infrared emission. And it turns out that every different species of animal has a unique thermal profile. They're warm and cold in different places on their bodies. They're not just different sizes and shapes. So once we've used the astrophysical software to detect the animals, we will then use machine learning to identify the species. And all of this, is, all of this ideally should happen as the drone is flying around. So as the drone flies around, it sees something hot, extracts a thermal profile, identifies what species it is, then it sends a message back to the users on the ground, be they conservationists or game wardens. So you could say, oh, I've seen a rhino over here, or I'm 92% sure, elephants over here. And if there is a man in the bush over there and he shouldn't be there, then you can take meaningful anti-poaching action before any harm can be done. Now, when I started this project, I expected that it would be pretty straightforward to find the animals, to detect them with the thermal infrared, and would it be catching poachers by tea time? But nothing in science is ever quite that simple. It turned out to be quite a lot more complicated than that. And in fact, this diagram has been expanded even more. So we've been using a lot of techniques from physics to sort of um, in the back end of the system to try and make it 
to get around all these issues. Um, I'm not going to go into details of those because I don't have a lot of time. But suffice to say, when you tell people that you're working in astroecology, it's a term that the media really like. And before you know, you've got the WWF knocking on your door and saying, hey, do you think that you could use this technology to find our favorite animal, our favorite location around the world? Um, so we were in fact invited to test and develop this at various locations with various species of animals. As you might guess, different, you, there are different needs for your drones and your algorithms, depending on what kind of environment the animal lives in and what kind of animal it is. So I'm going to breeze through a couple of our field studies here, starting off, hopefully, hopefully the slide will change. There we go, Hot, starting off with the orangutans. So orangutans are critically endangered and they live in rainforest, the rainforest, which is really hot, really humid, really thick vegetation. And heat and humidity um, was something we suspected that they might have a problem with. You're trying to detect a hot thing in a hot environment, you're going to really struggle to see it. And the forest itself is very dense. Uh, seeing through the vegetation we suspected would be a big problem. So we devised this strategy of um, having one of the, the local park rangers follow the orangutans to their nesting sites every night. So orangutans make a little nest every night that they sleep in. The game wardens would follow them and then they would tell us where the orangutans were and we would go and fly the drone out and see if we could see them. The other thing that we did was fly the drone out in a, a search pattern, a grid pattern, and look at the data afterwards and see what we saw. And for anything we thought was an orangutan, we'd send a game warden out to confirm whether or not that was the case. Now, the first night that we were there at the orangutan Re rehabilitation center, uh, this orangutan here was kind enough to build its nest above the car park where we were setting up the drone. So we knew it was there anyway, and as you can see, it's, it's not very obvious, even when the drone is quite close to the orangutan. But with the thermal camera, they were really, really easy to see. So we were pleased with this. Following this, um, we carried out our strategy, and for every single orangutan that the game wardens followed to a nest, we were able to find it with the drone. And for everything that we thought we saw that looked like an orangutan on our search pattern flights, it was in fact confirmed to be an orangutan. We also spotted some similar animals here. We've got the proboscis monkeys, similar size, similar shape. And um, we, sh we showed that we're actually able to tell the difference between the proboscis monkeys and the orangutans. Um, we also spotted a herd of, of pygmy elephants there, which aren't like small pygmy elephants. They're actually just small for elephants. One other fun thing about the thermal infrared um, as, a, as an instrument to use as opposed to an optical camera is that thermal infrared light has different properties to optical light. It can actually pass through some things that you can't see through with your eyes, such as fog. Uh, fog and smoke are two big ones. Um, while we were out in Malaysia looking for the orangutans, we had a particularly foggy day where we couldn't see very far at all with the regular camera, but with the thermal camera, we could still see the orangutans. As a result of this work, we've, also, we've now expanded the system to include things like search and rescue. Um, we work with a local search and rescue group to develop a system that can fly from long distances and see through smoke. We're also detecting underground fires in Indonesia to help, help combat that problem there. So the next animal that we went to look at after the orangutans were spider monkeys. We've already seen that the spider monkeys live in the forest. They're very difficult to see with a conventional camera. And there's not much point in investing in this really expensive technology if it doesn't work any better than walking around on the ground to find the animals. So for this field study, we adopted a slightly different approach and we had one of the local ecologists stand on the ground beneath the spider monkeys looking up at the same time as we flew the drone over and we compared the number of monkeys counted from the ground against those counted from the drone. So the bright blob in the middle of the right hand field of view here, that's Denise, she stood on the ground looking up at the spider monkeys. One of the things I really quite like about this video is it's really easy to see the monkeys moving around and count how many there are of the thermal camera, but with the, the regular RGB camera, you could see that there was something there, but you'd never be able to tell what or how many. So this is what we saw. On the left, you have the, the view from the ground from Denise and um, with the circles around the monkeys she spotted. One of the things about looking up at arboreal animals is that the sky is very bright and the animals don't stand out very clearly against it. So it's quite hard to monitor who's where and, and how many animals you're seeing. But obviously with the thermal camera from the drone, the, the spider monkeys were much easier to spot. Um, we compared the number of monkeys that we counted from the drone with those that were counted from the ground. And the first thing that we found was that the counts were consistent. If there was a small number of monkeys counted on the ground, we counted a small number from the drone, and the same with a large number of monkeys as well. But we also consistently found that the drone counts were slightly higher than the ground counts. 
and we believe that this indicates that the drum counts are more accurate. We're actually seeing more monkeys, we're not missing as many, and we're not miscounting as many as you might do with a ground survey. So I mentioned earlier on that we were hoping to use machine learning to automatically count and identify the animals, um, and that all the different species of animals have different and unique thermal profiles that we can use to do this. So here is actually our first experiment um, with using machine learning to automatically detect animals. This is the chimpanzee enclosure at Chester Zoo. Um, we have some of the zookeepers putting out the food for the chimpanzees. There's a couple of ducks around. Here are the chimps. So we were really pleased with this as a first test of machine learning with thermal profiles. You can see that it picks up the chimps, the birds, the people really quite well. It still spots the chimps even when they're partially obscured by vegetation. Um, and for a first go, this is it's actually pretty good. Um, but in this case, we have the thermal camera mounted on the end of a mast overlooking the chimpanzee enclosure. So how does it look when you put it on a drone? So here we have some, an example from the local safari park where we have rhinos, uh, let's try their type of antelope. So with the drone data, this works really well as well. Uh, we had to train the, the, the system to be able to distinguish um, dung as well, because we have a, you have a hot source and the machine learning tries to identify it as an animal if you don't train it that. So we are hoping to have this machine learning system running live on the drone within the next couple of weeks, weather permitting in the UK, obviously, to, to fly a drone. Um, and we'll have the first ever, as far as we know, world first thermal infrared live machine learning test, hopefully before the end of the year. If you're interested to know more about our work, here are some of our papers. We've um, done studies with several animals now, um, with the underground peat fires and with search and rescue. Um, we're also working towards new sensor development. So we, if you ever used a hyperspectral camera, you may know that they're quite big, they're quite heavy, they're quite expensive. We're using techniques based in physics to develop a new hyperspectral sensor. Um, and the, the take-home message is that drones and thermal infrared cameras can be used to monitor wildlife. But it's what you do with the sensors and the data that really counts. You really do have to think before you fly. Uh, things like the temperature of the ground, the environment that you're in, really can affect whether uh, or not the takes will work. So if you have any other questions, please do let me know. And here are a bunch of links for you if you uh, want to find out more. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks, Claire. Um, Oh, um, I'm just looking how to pronounce your name. Aiden? Did I get it right? right? Yeah, it's Aiden is how you pronounce it. Can you hear me? So close. Yeah, can you, you, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Claire, fascinating uh, work that you do. I had a quick question about uh, working with infrared in the marine realm. Uh, mm -hmm. I work on uh, humpbacks and fin whales predominantly and was literally just in talks about, uh, and you know, looking at bringing out an infrared drone next season. Um, to look at scarring and entanglement because of the scar tissue coming up uh, differently on a heat map. Uh, so I was just curious if you have any experience in that and if you have any comments on how well it works. Yeah, so we have used the thermal cam on a drone to detect dolphins, river dolphins. Um, thermal infrared cannot see through water um, mm -hmm. to more than a couple of centimetres. But when the dolphins come up, we do see them quite clearly. And that was in the Amazon, I think. So the water is quite warm, but the dolphins still show up. Um, with whales, um, especially like ones that live in cold waters, they might be very well insulated, but I imagine they're not going to be exactly the same surface temperature as the water. So you'd still see them. I'm not sure I can comment how well you'd see scarring. I know that we've seen injuries um, and illness with the thermal infrared camera, um, you know, areas of inflammation and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you had a, a very high resolution thermal camera, you may well be able to see scarring and things like that. But perhaps the best thing to do would be to put a thermal and RGB camera on your drone side by side. So you, you get the thermal infrared signature when something pops up and then you can look at the higher resolution RGB footage to tell what's, what it is. What it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Tom, do you want to jump in? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Great. Thanks so much, Claire, for that uh, really interesting, uh, interesting slides and presentation. Had a question about uh, the IDing that you showed. Was that post-processed? You took the thermal video and then ran it through the machine learning algorithm, or was it actually live with the with the flight itself? So this uh, the, this data I'm showing here, this was post-processed. 
So this has all been done after the fact, but we are going to do this live as the drone flies, live with all the computing running on the drone. Um, hopefully, yeah, basically the next time we can get out to the safari park and the weather is good. Very cool. Thanks. And what's the, so uh, you said in the next couple of weeks, what's the time frame for others being able to use this system? Is that the, that's the end goal, right? That is the end goal, yeah. We would like to make it as widely available as possible. But actually making it available depends on a couple of things. Um, first off, to train a reliable machine learning algorithm, you need a lot of examples of the thing you want to detect. And we have a very limited library of animals at the moment. So if anybody else has some thermal data they'd like to share, that you'd like us to be able to train to recognize animals, we would appreciate that. Um, we, um, we do have a lot of the community members do share data. Um, and I know, I know some are working with thermal stuff, so we can, we can possibly help. But does it have to be just, I know I interrupted, but does it have to be from above or? They, it works best when you're from above looking straight down. Yep. However, if you have a substantial amount of data taken from a different angle where you can you can tell what animal it is so if you can tell as an expert by looking at this data that that what animal that is and you're able to tag the data for us then we can train an algorithm to do the the recognition are you working with any of the tech companies we're not actually uh, you think this would be the kind of thing that google would jump on and um, we applied for a google ai grant some time back but didn't get it so did you apply for one of the micro microsoft ones um, we have some compute credits, but that's about it. Okay, we should. Um, yeah, I think there's. Um, I think there's probably we can help um, with like the images and and um, collaboration as well. Yeah. Um, were there any other questions from the group? Um, Iraji, uh, do you have? Oh, I'm not sure if I said your name correctly. I'm sorry. Do you have a mic? Do you want to jump in? Or would you prefer me to read it out? Is the sure for me to read it out or for you to jump in? <laughs> While we're waiting on that question. Uh, oh, me. Okay, I'm going ahead. Um, great. Uh, nice work, Claire. Do you also work in Nepal? Um, uh, it looked like it was on the map. Um, question around the, the question is do you use it to do megafauna census and we had actually quite a few questions about applications for megafauna um, um, monitoring mm -hmm. so we had a contact in Chitwan in Nepal but we haven't managed to get out there yet and um, all sorts of reasons so you know if someone if anyone has um, some megafauna in Nepal that they would like for us to come and visit and survey then you know I'm up for that okay good to know um, Okay, so we had uh, Mazidi. Do you want to jump in? Oh, hi, hi, hi. Good morning. Uh, it's midnight here, so <laughs> right. <laughs> I, have a, I have one question. So, based on the machine learning uh, software that you showed just now, mm -hmm. so it's only able to detect a live animal, isn't it? So, how about in case of uh, in our project area? We try to quant to quantify the number of nests, orangutan nests. So would it be possible to use it to detect orangutan nests, to separate it from the uh, the trees, or would it be possible like to uh, to classify the type of nest, whether it's new, whether it's old? Would That's it be possible? Great. I know of a group who's doing this with orangutan nests with. RGB yeah. images taken from drones. So yeah, it's definitely possible to do it. Um, again, not my area, but if you want to look up, I think it's Orangutan Nest Watch is the, the name of the group who do it. Yeah. Okay. Because right. I just um, got back from Orangutan survey this morning. So <laughs> yeah. um, I'll jump, uh, I'll drop a link into um, Sol's um, uh, profile on Wild Labs who's, um, who works on that project so you can connect with him. Um, and cool. Okay, we had, sorry, just let me check. Um, hmm. Oh, uh, one question that Talia pointed out was, um, so the limitations on your project becoming more widely available, um, one thing you said was around training data. Was there, what, what other limitations were there? Um, so the, 
the system as it is is sort of a prototype. Uh, it's, it sort of runs on a Raspberry Pi type um, computer that's stuck to the, the drone. So in that case, it will be, you know, who has got a, a drone that can lift the kit, has the right camera that sort of fits with the spec we've got at the moment. Again, because it yeah. is a prototype, it works with the spec as we've set it up. We're hoping to expand it to include basically everyone and anyone's um, thermal camera setups, but it'll still require you to stick a little module on that we have all the hardware and software specified for onto the drone to do the processing. Um, and in some ways, I guess this is a thing with it, any tech project, you get to a certain point where it has to be able to get out. Um, and we haven't really thought about the, the mass distribution of it yet. We're perfectly happy to work with groups um, and sort of co-develop a drone and a heart and computing system with them. Uh, it's really just a case of doing it. Thank you.